Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, good morning. Okay. <clears throat> Rabbi's not home. Hello. 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 Where's Rabbi? Rabbi's not home. <laughs> good morning. Good morning. It looks like I have a different backdrop here. <clears throat> yeah. I'm in San Diego. I'm in. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, lucky you. Downtown San Diego. Yeah, we're visiting Dina. We're going back today, but we uh, spent the last few days here. So I'll show you the hotel in uh, the, the meeting rooms. We're downtown San Diego. It's really um, it's strange, nice. strange uh, time to be in uh, anywhere, but uh, it's not really a vacation. Well, kind of a vacation, but uh, it is strange today because it's uh, going back to school day for most people in Santa Clarita and um, it is not the f way we wanted first day of school to be so um, it's one of those kind of tough days for a lot of people watching people post pictures of their kids going off to the computer um, <laughs> not, not what we were hoping for but I guess we couldn't be really surprised really knowing that we didn't have we didn't have a vaccine how could we possibly have kids go back to school so um yeah it was one of those days where this really sad scene thank god we don't live in texas i yeah i really? don't uh i don't know what to tell families right now during this time other than just uh you know again there we've we've gotten through tougher things and we will get through this but it's not um it's not uh, not a great time for kids today. So, if you lived in Russia, you can get a vaccine. If we are true, true. You want to be remember, all kids? your exes live in Texas. Yeah. By the I'm way, glad it, they're going to test it. If it works, good for them. <laughs> speaking of that, speaking of that, we could all be back in Russia uh, visiting our uh, many of our homeland. I don't know how many people saw American Pickle so far on. Uh, HBO, the uh, Seth Rogen movie that uh, oh, that's right. was being um, uh, talked about over the last couple of weeks. I saw it. I was not, I was not really impressed. Unfortunately, it was uh, kind of a little disappointing. It was not. I li I like Seth Rogen. I like uh, the concept, and unfortunately, it was just not not executed uh -huh. great. But um, it didn't get a very good review. It was really disjointed. I, I don't know if it was edited improperly or too many people came in to try to work on it. Um, uh, it just didn't work. It just, um, it was disappointing. As, I, as, I, as I've mentioned before, it's kind of like, um, I like ice cream, I like pizza. I don't like pizza ice cream. And I like, I like Seth Rogen, I like Jewish movies. This didn't, I, I was so disappointed in, in yeah, uh -huh. how badly it was executed and um, whatever. I mean, you know, uh, they tried to get the movie to people uh, during the pandemic, which I appreciate, but, you know, wait a year if you have to, in order to make it, um, it wasn't, it wasn't really, uh, they, you know, it was supposed to be, I think in the end, kind of uplifting and, and bittersweet or whatever, but it just, it just fell flat. Anyways, I wish I could recommend it. Um, that being said, it is a very Jewish movie and it does touch on some um, important tropes in, uh, in uh, American Judaism, but I, I, like I said, I can't recommend it and, and I, wish, uh, I wish it had been executed a little differently. Anyways, um, not what I think people expected from Seth Rogen. Anyways, that being said, there is, uh, you know, there are, uh, there are things coming out, I, I hope, over the course of the next months, which will be um, uplifting. And we're working real hard on our, our high holiday production, which, which uh, I have a meeting, uh, meeting with a producer later on today. I, I hope she decides that she wants to work on it. She's a Emmy Award winning producer. And who knows, maybe that'll be the... Uh, the big production of of uh, of the year. A lot of synagogues are are 
much, obviously much bigger and wealthier than, than ours, are spending a lot of time and money. Uh, Sinai Temple on Wilshire is spending roughly $300,000 on their holiday production, which is roughly equal to our annual budget. Uh, um, <laughs> and I think that, that's not an exaggeration, either one of those things. I wish they were, but um, they, uh, yeah, they are working on they were working on that kind of budget. Um, and uh, I had a really nice discussion yesterday with Craig Taubman from, uh, who actually works at, sometimes at Sinai Temple, but has his own Pico Union project now um, about what's going on for music. And there are some really great things that we're gonna be uh, connected to no matter what, but uh, it is unfortunately a little bit more of a production um, and, less, um, and less of a, of, of the normal type of high holiday preparation that we're normally engaged uh, engaged with at this time, and we are about to move into that to that um, time. I mean, we're about a week and a half away from the month of Elul, the last um, month of the Jewish year starting, and um, we have what, what's called the forty day period of introspection, which begins at the month, the beginning of that last month of Elul, and goes to the first ten days of of the uh, high holidays from Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, that 40 day period, that 40 day block is a 40 day period like they have, we have other traditions that have 40 day periods, right? The Lent period and there's 40 day periods, of course, that are based on the, on the Bible. But this 40 day period we're in is, uh, is um, about, we're about in, uh, about to enter that period. Uh, yeah, Yom Kippur is basically 50 days away, which means the whole thing is going to be over in 50 days. I'm not saying I'm looking forward to that date, but it is 50 days away. <laughs> Everything has to be done over the next 50 days. Anyways, but that being said, uh, we are going to uh, jump into the Midrash in a, in a moment. Um, it's good to see everybody here. And again, for those that join late, I I do have a different backdrop as I'm in San Diego right now, and uh, I look forward to um, the time soon that we'll be able to be together in in a room, uh, you know, in a room and in a, a space where we can all be safe and bring in those people who are out of town, like Diane. Uh, that is our goal. So. Um, <clears throat> That being said, I'm going to put us I'm up coming, on. I'm coming. Whenever, it's, whenever I can, I'm coming. Well, we're 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 going to make sure that we're streaming when we do have a live and in-person class again. That we will be able to do that again. So, um, and again, it's allowed me to do uh, classes from remote locations too. So, there are there are some silver linings here. So. We have, uh, we have a chance to, to look at the Joseph story, which by the way, is kind of a, I don't know how it, you know, it came out that we were reading the Joseph story now during, you know, during our Midrash times. But, you know, it's interesting because there is, there's a, there is a theme in the Joseph uh, stories that kind of, to me, really speaks to us right now. I mean, it's partly because Joseph spends time spends time trapped, you know, he's, he's, uh, you know, he's, he's, uh, you know, he has that time in prison, obviously, but there also is this kind of a feeling like, um, especially, e and even in this time when, when he gets reunited with his family, that there is, that there's a feeling of, um, I don't want to say incompletion, that's not really, it's not just incompletion, that there's a feeling like, um, we're, we're trying to do our best in, in, in a time when things are not right. And, and, you know, the interesting thing about the story is that the backdrop for the Joseph story is, is, is that there's a famine, is that there's a worldwide, it's not a pandemic, but it's a worldwide, uh, or at least a Mediterranean worldwide, their, their region, it's affecting on, a, on, a, on their global scale, it's affecting their lives. And, and so in the midst of the famine, the family is trying to figure out how to survive. And there is a, uh, there's a feeling to that, which, which 
is really seems to me really uh, really uh, timely. And uh, there there are times when the story doesn't quite speak to me in that level, but right now it does. And and so where we're picking up right now in the story is that we are um, the family is is uh, well where we left off is is the brothers were returned back to Canaan with, with their food, but with also the warning, don't come back here unless you bring Benjamin, which again, seems to be Joseph's ploy to reunite with Benjamin, with his full brother. But why this is, um, let me share this up on the screen, why this is such a, an issue, um, and why Joseph goes through these lengths in order to try to reunite with his brother you know, it's kind of an interesting question, one that um, the Midrash doesn't really answer, which is why doesn't Joseph just go there and bring Benjamin back himself? If this is all an elaborate ruse just to bring Benjamin back, why doesn't he just go and take his army and, you know, go liberate Benjamin? Why go through this? But there does seem to be uh, a desire that Joseph has to really see if the brothers have changed and whether Benjamin is being treated differently than he did, which again, then gets to the question, does Joseph really want to see if maybe he was the reason why he was at fault? And as we mentioned over the last few weeks, there's also this bigger issue, which is that Joseph seems to be, um, have accepted the fact, and again, he, because he has prophetic abilities and because he can kind of see the future, that he is going along with this, with this whole plan of bringing the of bringing his whole family down to Egypt in the first place, that he has to, he has to facilitate this, um, this uh, divine plan to have the Israelites be down in Egypt. In which case, Joseph is is, it's not really about him reunited with Benjamin, so to speak, but to have the whole family come down, and have this have this happen. Which again still begs the question: Why doesn't he just tell the family who he is and bring everybody down? Um, so the, the Midrash goes on, on and on and on about what happens here. But remember, those are all issues that, that, you know, kind of are in the background. And as I said, the biggest issue in the background is, hey, there's a famine going on. They're, they're, they don't have food. And that, uh, real, that reality of not having food, that, that, that's got to, you know, that's got to affect your state of mind. I mean, that's got to affect what you're thinking about. And even though maybe famine was more common during the times of the Bible and during the time of the Midrash, it, it, I mean, okay, it was more common. It was more of a, of, a, of a reality, but that didn't make it easy. So that is the backdrop for what we're reading now, which is um, the, the, the family now being in a situation where <clears throat> they have to um, they have to go back. So let's read what happened. So the last thing we read is that um, the last thing we read was that uh, was that the brothers tell Jacob, they all tell their father that they, if they go back, they have to bring they have to bring Benjamin. That he wants to see Benjamin, the, the the assistant to Pharaoh. Of course, again, not knowing that this is their their brother and Jacob's favorite son. All of that isn't, um, of course, revealed yet to, to Jacob, and um, and and Reuben goes far as saying, "Look, I will give you my, I will kill my own sons if anything happens to Benjamin." And Jacob, the last thing we read is Jacob says, "What do I, I mean? I, your sons, my grandsons, are already mine. Why? What would? What good would there be in killing them? Uh, I, you know." And so. Basically, the last thing that we read was Judah tells the brothers, stop telling our father, stop this discussion enough already. It doesn't matter what, what Jacob says. When we run out of food, we're going to have to go back. So when that happens, then we'll come back and we'll have this discussion. But don't, don't keep bothering Jacob about it. It's just upsetting him. So that's where we left off. And so, so now we continue with... Um, the story of, we return to the story of, um, the story of Joseph and his brother. So again, we got everybody with us, got a nice, nice group together on our journey through the Midrash. 
So, um, and again, I apologize if the video doesn't work. I'm not at home. It's not in your mic control. I, I am at the uh, hotel in San Diego right now, the Carte Hotel down in, right on the border of Little Italy and downtown. So anyways, hopefully it'll, hopefully it'll stay, stay strong. Uh, Rosemary, you want to take us on the turn to Egypt? The second journey to Egypt. When the supplies bought in Egypt were eaten up and the family of Jacob began to suffer with hunger, the little children came to him and they said, give us bread that we die not of hunger before you. The words of the little ones brought scorching tears to the eyes of Jacob. And he summoned his sons and bade them go again down into Egypt and buy food. But Judas said to him, the man did solemnly protest to us saying we should not see his face unless our brother Benjamin was with us and we cannot appear before him with idle pretexts. And Jacob said, why did you deal so ill with me as to tell the man whether you had another brother? It was the first and only time Jacob indulged in empty talk and God said, I made it my business to raise his son to the position of ruler of Egypt and he complains and says, why did you deal so ill with me? And Judah protested against the reproach that he had initiated the Egyptian viceroy in their family relations with the words, why, he knew the very wood of which our baby coaches are made. Father, he continued, if Benjamin goes with us, he may indeed be taken from us, but also he may not. This is a doubtful matter, but it, it is certain that if he does not go with us, we shall all die of hunger. It is better not to concern yourself about what is doubtful and guide your actions by what is certain. The king of Egypt is a strong and mighty king. And if we go to him without our brother, we shall all be put to death. Do you not know and have you not heard that this king is very powerful and wise and there is none like to him in all the earth? We have seen all the kings of the earth, but none like to the king of Egypt. One would surely say that among all the kings of the earth, there is none greater than Abimelech, king of the Philistines, yet the king of Egypt is greater and mightier than he and Abimelech can hardly be compared with one of his officers. Father, you have not seen his palace and his throne and all his servants standing before him. You have not seen that king upon his throne in all his magnificence and with his royal insignia arrayed in his royal robes with a large golden crown upon his head. You have not seen the honor and the glory that God has given to him for there is none like to him in all the earth. Father, you have not seen the wisdom, the understanding and the knowledge that God has given in his heart. We heard his sweet voice when he spoke to us. We know not father who acquainted him with our names and all that befell us. He asked also concerning you saying, is your father still alive and is it well with him? You have not seen the affairs of the government of Egypt regulated by him for none asks his Lord Pharaoh about them. You have not seen the awe and the fear that he imposes upon all the Egyptians. Even we went out of his presence threat and the fear he imposes upon, even he went out from his presence threatening to do unto Egypt as to unto the cities of the Amorites and exceedingly wroth by reason of all his words that he spake concerning us as spies. Yet when we came before him, his terror fell upon us all and none of us was able to speak a word to him, great or small. Now, therefore, Father, send the lad with us and we will arise and go down into Egypt and buy food to eat that we die not of hunger. Yeah. And so again, uh, Judah tells Jacob, look, you know, this guy, know, he knows everything. He seems to know everything about us. There's nothing we could conceal from him. So he, he, he asked even about you. So this is kind of a reminder, again, that, that Joseph, again, not knowing that this is their brother, Joseph, this man that they think is, is uh, you know, is essentially basically the, the ruler of Egypt, you know, can do anything he wants. And, you know, they, they Judah definitely conveys to them, uh, to his father, that they were, again, they, they were, they were very humbled to be in the in the presence of of Joseph. Now, 
Interestingly, the Torah does tell us that Jacob still obviously is concerned about Benjamin, but he's also, he also seems to be concerned about appearing to be um, a poor farmer or, or, or poor herdsman, if you will, when, when the family appears before Joseph. And so this is an interesting thing that the Torah does have. Um, and of course, uh, Judah is very good at speaking. He's very eloquent. He's one of the oldest brothers. But um, Jacob is also trying to figure out how he's going to be positioned in this as well. But here, let's get back to Judah and what Judah says. Judah offered his portion in the world to come as surety for Benjamin. And thus solemnly, he promised to bring him back safe and sound. And Jacob granted his request and permitted Benjamin to go down into Egypt with his other sons. They also carried with them choice presents from their father for the ruler of Egypt, things that arouse wonder outside of Palestine, such as the murex, which is the snail that produces the Tyrian purple, and various kinds of balm and almond oil and pistachio oil and honey as hard as stone. Furthermore, Jacob put double money in their hand to provide against a rise in prices in the meantime. After all these matters were attended to, he spoke to his sons saying, here is money and here is a present and also your brother. Is there anything else that you need? And they replied, yes, we need this besides that you should intercede for us with God. Then their father prayed, O Lord, you who at the time of creation did call enough to heaven and earth when they stretched themselves out further and further toward infinity, set a limit to my sufferings too. Say unto them, enough. God Almighty give you mercy before the ruler of Egypt that he may release unto you Joseph, Shimon, and Benjamin. Now, this is uh, um, Jacob again attempting to show that he does have the means to pay for the food. Uh, and the Torah tells us that. The Torah says, literally, uh, Jacob said to them, take some of the choice products of the land in your baggage and carry them down as a gift for the man, some balm and some honey, gum, laudanum, pistachio nuts, and almonds. That's the translation of those, of those uh, things that he says he brings down. And again, the reason why it uses the word Palestine, we've discussed this before, is that in, in Ginsburg's time, that was the translation for the land of Israel. There was no uh, modern Israel when he wrote this 100 years ago. Uh, and again, in the, in the Talmudic period, the rabbis didn't use the term Palestine. Uh, they used the term Israel or Canaan or Eretz Israel uh, or Judea, but they did not use uh, they did not use the term Palestine. It was a Roman term, not a Jewish term. But again, during the time of, of, uh, of Ginsburg, that was the that was the area, as it was called on, on maps and geographically at the time. Look, the reality is, is that he's trying to show Jacob's trying to show that the land of Israel is um, has valuable products. That there is uh, that he's a wealthy man. He is uh, trying to show that, again, he's not some country bunk into this, to the Egyptians. And again, he's not, he doesn't know that this is his own son that he's trying to impress. But he's trying to prepare his sons uh, for this return. And, of course, the most important thing he gives to his family is a blessing. And the blessing that he says, essentially, is, God, please, you know, enough, enough already. I've had enough problems. Um, can, can this just be the end of it? And, you know, through some miracle, can I get my sons back? Uh, Simon, who's Shimon, who's still down there. Uh, Benjamin, who's now going down there and who, who he recognizes runs the risk of being held captive, which again, it seems as though the brothers and Jacob understand that Benjamin is being lured down there from the beginning. And then again, this part is not in the Torah, is, is Jacob's prayer. Uh, and that somehow, somehow, is Joseph is Joseph still is Joseph still down there? Well, we've already read this last week in the midrash that Jacob has this feeling because again he has divine powers 
that Joseph is really not dead, that he actually is somehow still there. Um, so I don't know why he'd say he's in Egypt, but again, that he gets his sons back. Um, now, again, it's a really interesting prayer, which seems to, again, show us that Jacob has the power, prophetic powers, which, again, the rabbis would assert. Of course he does. But the prayer really isn't about those three sons in particular. Here's what it is. This prayer was an intercession not only for the sons of Jacob, but also for their descendants, that God would deliver the ten tribes in time to come as he delivered the two, Judah and Benjamin. And after he permitted the destruction of two temples, he would grant endless continuance to the third. It's not about those brothers. It's not about those guys. It's about their descendants. And specifically, it's about those lost tribes, the 10 lost tribes, that one day they would be reunited um, and that all the tribes would be able to, um, uh, you know, would be able to survive and, and be found and be reconciled and returned back to the Jewish people. But these lost tribes would, um, this would be part of what the Messiah would do. And in the Messianic age, the temple would be rebuilt, the third temple. And once the third temple would be rebuilt, it would never end. But that third temple would not be destroyed like the other two. So that all the tribes would come back together, the restoration of those lost tribes, and the temple being rebuilt and never being destroyed again. This was the hope of what the Messianic era would be. Those really two things, the restoration of the people and the restoration of the temple. And I guess, you know, by continuation or by extension, that it would never be destroyed. That third temple would be the last and final temple. It would never be destroyed. But this idea that the tribes would come back, that they would be reunited, became a very important part of Midrash, a very important part of Jewish imagination forever until this time but somehow when the messiah comes that the tribes will be reunited and they will be um will be found these last tribes will be found wherever they are and um that jewish people would be um found in these hidden places whether again whether it was in Ethiopia recently, which some people hailed as a, you know, as kind of a messianic event. Um, but of course, this is a foundation of Mormon theology. I mean, this is this idea that the lost tribes are scattered around the world and that somehow, again, you know, finding them and bringing them back to, the, to Israel is part of, of what has to happen for the end of days. Uh, you know, kind of to happen. And, and whether or not they're the lost tribes or where, where today some evangelical Christians believe that, again, that returning Jews from Russia or from even the United States is necessary for us to um, live in the Messianic era, this is an important part of theology today. It's not, it's probably less relevant to most Jews, but it is really relevant to a lot of Christians that, that somehow these lost tribes will come back. And interestingly, again, it's a very, ancient, it's a very ancient part of, of the middle. I have at the moment the white ones. Yeah, they should be there. Yeah. So <laughs> okay. um, it is part of the, um, it is part of the, um, the Midrash, and it is part of, of uh, Jewish literature. But again, today, one can make the argument it's really important for uh, Christian uh, belief. And again, as I said, within, within Mormon theology, it is a foundation of, foundation of their belief uh, that these lost tribes will be returned. And again, whether they, again, the myth was that there was a whole kingdom of, of the lost Jews that was, you know, that was on the other side of a river that couldn't be crossed, the Sambatyon River, which, which uh, again, when the Messiah comes, that river 
that river will uh, be crossed and, and people will be able to be reunited. But that somehow over the rainbow, there was uh, the tribes living there and ready and waiting to be reunited with, with the rest of Israel has always been kind of this part of what has to happen in order for, you know, for the Messiah to come and to do the, you know, to do his work. Um, again, less of, of the battles that have to be won, that, you know, the, the Messiah leads us in fighting, but more reuniting and rebuilding the, the temple. So this is one of those places that the rabbis inserted it as well, which was Jacob's prayer, which again is not really in the Torah. It's more in the Torah of, of it does say specifically that Jacob pays or, or gives this uh, stuff ready to buy the, ready to buy the food. All right, so here's another piece here. Jacob also put a letter addressed to the viceroy of Egypt into the hands of his son. The letter ran thus, from your servant Jacob, the son of Isaac, the grandson of Abraham, prince of God, to the mighty and wise king, Zephenathapanea, the ruler of Egypt, peace. I make known to my lord the king that the famine is sore with us in the land of Canaan. And I have therefore sent my sons to you to buy us a little food that me, we may live and not die. My children surrounded me and begged for something to eat. But alas, I am very old and I cannot see with my eyes for they are heavy with the weight of years. And also on account of my never ceasing tears for my son Joseph who has been taken from me. I charged my sons not to pass through the gate altogether at the same time when they arrived in the city of Egypt in consideration of the inhabitants of the land that they might not take undue notice of them. Also, I bade them go up and down in the land of Egypt and seek my son Joseph. Maybe they would find him there. This they did do, but you accounted therefore that they were spies. We have heard the report of your wisdom and sagacity. How then can you look upon their countenances and yet declare them to be spies? Scroll. Yep. Especially as we have heard you interpreted Pharaoh's dream and foretold the coming of the famine, we are amazed that you in your discernment could not distinguish whether they are spies or not. Yeah, so this is not in the Torah at all. This this letter, this it's a message, little cheeky. <laughs> yeah, this message from Jacob isn't there at all. But again, in the midrash, it wants to tell us that Jacob kind of is a little bit more um, um, forceful and uh, a little bit pr a little bit more proud than than maybe the the Torah gives us. Though the Torah does hint at it. Because the Torah does say he gave gifts. It does say he gave double the portion of money. It does say that. But then this letter, this kind of, yeah, Joseph, you must know these are really not spies. You're that, you're smart, right? So you know these aren't real spies. Um, and again, this is all Jacob kind of showing, you know, playing a political game with, with, uh, with Joseph. Uh, you know, again, I mean, Jacob's goal is to protect his sons. And now, O oh my Lord King, I send to you my son Benjamin, as you demanded of my other sons. I pray you take good care of him until you send him back to me in peace with his brothers. Have you not heard, and do you not know what God did to Pharaoh when he took our mother Sarah to himself, or what happened to Abimelech on account of her, and what our father Abraham did to the nine kings of Elam, how he killed them and exterminated their armies, though he had but few men with him? Or have you not heard what my two sons, Shimon and Levi, did to the eight cities of the Amorites, which they destroyed on account of their sister Dina? Benjamin consoled them for the loss of Joseph. What then will they do to him that stretches forth a hand of power to snatch him away from them? So that's a little bit of a threat, too. Yeah. Which is, Joseph, you know what, what these people are, what our people are capable of doing, including, again, going back to Abraham. Now, again, he has no idea that he's threatening kind of his own son, but he is, he is boasting about the power that the uh, Jews already, have, or, you know, the early Israelites, whatever, Abraham's family, 
can already do. And again, some of it's in the Torah and, mo and much of it is also in the Midrash. The fact that, you know, Simon and Levi didn't just destroy Shechem, they ended up destroying other Amorite cities too, which we read in the Midrash that, again, this was the consequence for destroying Shechem is that they had to destroy these other, these other Canaanite cities too. So again, Amorites are, are not a synonym for Canaanites. Um, so again, these are all, these are all uh, kind of, uh, you know, warnings, if you will. Um, of course, contained in the warning is also this beautiful message of, um, think about how upset they were at Joseph, at losing Joseph. Um, so this is a, uh, this is probably going to be an emotional thing for, again, as Joseph hears this, to know that the, or to hear his father say that the brothers were um, uh, so beaten up over losing Joseph. Of course, Joseph knows what happened. He knows that the brothers, on the contrary, are the ones who threw him in the pit in the first place. But this idea that, that uh, his loss, his own, that not, you know, hearing now about what his family felt about losing him, is going to trigger some type of response. It's going to provoke a, an emotional response because he's now talking about, Jacob is, is ironically talking about Joseph, to Joseph. And so this is a, this is a theme that is in the Torah because Ju Judah does talk about it. Uh, again, Judah is the, is the leader in this return. Judah, as we, as we see or in the Torah, is the one who, who speaks on behalf of everybody. And remember, it was Judah who wanted Joseph sold into slavery in the first place. He argues on behalf of uh, sparing Joseph and not having him murdered. So Judah is really a leader amongst his brothers. Um, of course, it explains why Judah is the brother who ends up being the ancestor of the Jewish people, right, of King David and that line and that kingdom, the, the, the Jews, Judah is the brother who is, uh, has got some qualities that make him uh, different. Um, but again, he is taking that role and he is also putting himself out on the line. Um, the Midrash tells us that he was willing to give up his place in the world to come. Of course, the Torah doesn't say that because the Torah doesn't talk about the world to come. It doesn't talk about heaven or at the afterlife in the Torah itself. It really doesn't. So where do the rabbis get off saying that Judas says he'll give up his place in the world to come? The reality is, is that he says he's taking on the responsibility for, for, uh, you know, for bringing Benjamin down. And what he says in the Torah, the line that he actually says in the Torah, which kind of allows the rabbis to say, is that he says the words, um, forever. He says, um, when, when uh, Judah says to his father, when he says to Jacob, let me go, he says to him, um, the actual line is, uh, his actual line is, um, Let me give it to you. Um, um, the, the line is, um, Judah said to his father, send the boy in my care and let us be on our way that we may live and not die. You and we and our children. I myself will be surety for him. You may hold me responsible if I do not bring him back and set him before you. I shall stand guilty before you forever. And the forever part means, according to the rabbis, not just in this world, but in the world to come. And so, um, you know, Judah basically says, look, we have no choice. We have to go. But it is um, partly, again, because he gives up, he's willing to give up his soul in the world to come. 
Uh, so that's where that that's where that comes from. Um, all right. Let's, scroll down. Let's go to. Uh, Know you not, O king of Egypt, that the might of our God is with us, and he always hearkens unto our prayers and never forsakes us? Had I called upon God to rise up against you when my sons told me how you acted toward them, you and your people, you all would have been annihilated before Benjamin could come down to you. But I reflected that Shimon, my son, was abiding in your house, and perhaps you were doing kindnesses to him. And therefore, I invoked not the punishment of God on you. Now my son Benjamin goes down to you with my other sons. Take heed to yourself, keep your eyes directed upon him, and God will direct his eye upon all your kingdom. Right. I have said all now that is in my heart. Yeah, finish, yeah, finish this last paragraph. Yeah. Yeah. My sons take their youngest brother down to Egypt with them, and do you send them all back to me in peace? Yep, and so this is Jacob's letter to his uh, to Joseph. Again, not knowing that it's Zophanat Panea, but it's the letter that ends up again going to to uh, to Joseph. So it is uh, on one hand uh, threatening, menacing. It's also uh, evocative of um, again how important his sons are to him, which again by extension is Joseph himself, and. Um, and um, again, it's kind of Jacob having something to be said on his behalf, which is important because again, if Joseph is going to, um, if Joseph is only going to be hearing from the brothers, he may not be very impressed because again, these are brothers that sold him into slavery, that threw him in a pit and almost killed him. But if there's a message from his father, this actually may, may, may end up making a big difference. And again, it's not in the Torah. So there's kind of like this insertion in the Midrash that allows for us to kind of, oh, well, maybe there was something else that affected Joseph besides just his brothers coming there. Okay, so this letter might, um, might have been the, you know, again, the, the final piece of this. Here we go. This letter Jacob put into the keeping of Judah, charging him to deliver it to the ruler of Egypt. His last words to his sons were an admonition to take good care of Benjamin and not leave him out of their sight, either on the journey or after their arrival in Egypt. He bade farewell to them and then turned in prayer to God saying, O Lord of heaven and earth, remember your covenant with our father Abraham. Remember also my father Isaac and grant grace to my sons and deliver them not into the hands of the king of Egypt. O oh my God, do it for the sake of your mercy. Redeem my sons and save them from the hands of the Egyptians and restore their two brothers to them. Also the women and the children in the house of Jacob prayed to God amid tears and entreated him to redeem their husbands and their fathers out of the hands of the king of Egypt. Yeah, so... Um, this is, I mean, this is the, the tension and the fear that Jacob's family had at this moment of sending the brothers back down, uh, knowing that, um, they, there seem, this seems to be a setup, you know, this whole thing seems to be, a, um, you know, a problem. The accusation of them being spies in the first place, them going back and finding their money was returned to them, and are they going to be accused now of stealing them the food in the first place? All of these things, and again, this weird, you got to bring Benjamin down next time. Uh, all of this is, is weighing heavily on, on Jacob and his family. I mean, I guess you can ask the question, why doesn't Jacob go down too? Right? Why doesn't Jacob? And again, the rabbis kind of are, they don't answer that question, but they, they answer you with that, you know, if you had that question, which is he can't, he can't 
if he goes down, then uh, no one's left back in, in Canaan to protect the family. Um, and there is this sense that we're doing everything we can to stay in the land of Israel, to fulfill this promise of, you know, this is our land and we're not going to leave. We're not going to go. Uh, and we're risking more lives, but if we don't, then everybody dies. Right? So if we don't go down, if the, if the brothers don't go down, if the fathers and now grandfathers don't go down, then everybody dies. So, um, this is a, you know, this is a, this is a tough situation for them, right? It's not, it's not easy. Uh, there's not really an easy out. There's no easy answer. Um, and so kind of, you know, let's see what happens. And this is now the reunification of Joseph with his full brother, Benjamin, who he really didn't get to know, right? So he's been, he's been down in Egypt for the last, you know, 30 years. He doesn't know Benjamin. His brother, who's his full brother, the brother that we assume he would have been really close to, he doesn't know. So um, this is a strange irony. Uh, and let us read what happens. Joseph and Benjamin. Great was the joy of Joseph when he saw his brothers stood before him and Benjamin was with them. In his youngest brother, he saw the true counterpart of his father. He ordered his son Manasseh, the servant, the steward of his house, to bring the men into the palace and make ready a meal for them. But he was to take care to prepare the meat dishes in the presence of the guests, so that they might see with their own eyes that the cattle had been slaughtered according to the ritual prescriptions, and the sinew of the hip which is upon the hollow of the thigh had been removed. The dinner to which Joseph invited his brethren was a Sabbath meal, for he observed the seventh day even before the revelation of the law. The sons of Jacob refused the invitation of the steward and a scuffle ensued. While he tried to force them into the banqueting hall, they tried to force him out, for they feared it was but a ruse to get possession of them and their asses on account of the money they had found in their sacks on their return from their first journey to Egypt. In their modesty, they put the loss of their beasts upon the same level as the loss of their personal liberty. To the average man, Property is as precious as life itself. Yeah, so um, not a not a great uh, presentation of of the brothers, but they don't know what's going on, right? So they don't know that Joseph is trying to, uh, you know, just there to maybe continue to test them, but but uh, see them in action. They, they're suspicious of the whole thing. Again, because they still feel that they're going to get in trouble. The fact that they, did, they returned home in the first place with the money. That Joseph never got, they, that, you know, Joseph had put the money back in their sacks. And so this whole, they're, they're constantly feeling when they're in Egypt that they're being set up. The, and, and to some extent, they're right. They are being set up. They, they, they know there's a ruse. They just don't know what it is. They think that they're being set up to be assaulted or being to be robbed. They're going to be robbed. They don't know what's happening, but they do know that something is happening. And they're right. There is something happening. Joseph is playing a game with them. They don't know the rules of the game, and they just, they just feel like they are um, pawns in this. And they are. Uh, but again, they're not behaving really well. Uh, of course, the, the Midrash also tells us that Joseph has been keeping Shabbat which is kind of almost contradictory to the image that we have of Joseph, who seems to be fairly assimilated Egyptian by this point. But the rabbis want to tell us, no, he wasn't. He wasn't really, he wasn't as Egyptian as you think he was. He was still celebrating, he was actually celebrating Shabbat, which technically speaking, we haven't even heard the laws of Shabbat. It doesn't come out. We don't get those until we get into Exodus. But this idea that Shabbat is a Torah law and the Torah was to some extent taught to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Of course, they, you know, if, if those laws are timeless, then 
then those people celebrated Shabbat too. So the rabbis kind of step back and say, you know, this is a Shabbos meal that Joseph had with his family back in Egypt, which would have been an opulent meal. It would have been a meal where there was, it would have been good food, obviously kosher food, but the Torah does tell us that this, that there was this meal, that that was the, the meal that the family is reunited. And, um, it seems as though it was a, you know, a special, a special scene, if you will. So here, here we go. Standing at the door of Joseph's house, they spoke to the steward and said, we are in badly reduced circumstances. In our country, we supported others, and now we depend upon you to support us. After these introductory words, they offered him the money they had found in their sacks. The steward reassured them concerning the money, saying, however it may be, whether for the sake of your own merits or for the sake of the merits of your fathers, God has caused you to find a treasure, for the money you paid for the corn came into my hand. Then he brought Shimon out to them. Their brother looked like a leather bottle, so fat and rotund had he grown during his sojourn in Egypt. He told his brothers what kind treatment had been accorded to him. The very moment they left the city, he had been released from prison, and thereafter he had been entertained with splendor in the house of a ruler of Egypt. So let's pause right there. Remember, because Shimon, during this whole time that they were back in Israel, back in the land of Israel, their brother was down in Egypt being held hostage, right? So uh, the question of what happened to Shimon while he was there is, um, you know, they get at this party, they get reunified with Shimon too. And so that is an important part of, of the story is that Shimon was treated well. He wasn't treated poorly while he was down in Egypt. As a matter of fact, he comes out and he is um, looking, very, <laughs> looking very healthy. He's been well fed mm -hmm. while, he, while he's been in Egypt. Now, of course, that, that in a way, this contrasts with their own situation. Um, and uh, the Torah doesn't say that he comes out looking like that, but... The Torah does say that he brought out Shimon to them. And uh, the Midrash, by telling us that Shimon has become very well fed while he's there, uh, well, first of all, they were running out of food back in the land of Israel. And you know, ironically, Shimon, who they thought was in prison, was actually now doing quite well, being treated very well back in Egypt. And assumedly, again, you know, staying in a beautiful you know, mansion while they were back in the land of Canaan, land of Israel. Um, now, this, by the way, would already put them at ease. The Torah doesn't actually do that. The Torah actually just says Simon was brought out. It doesn't say that, you know, he comes out looking like this and they all, you know, are starting to feel maybe a little bit more at ease of what's going to happen to them. The tension in the Torah is still there. Um, and, um, you know, it's still, it's, it still lasts for a few more, uh, a few more lines in the Torah. Uh, this would have already put the brothers maybe again, a little bit, um, uh, a little bit at ease, but here's Joseph now. When Joseph made his appearance, Judah took Benjamin by the hand and presented him to the viceroy and they all bowed down themselves to him to the earth. Joseph asked them concerning the welfare of their father and their grandfather, and they made reply, your servant, our father, is well. He is yet alive. And Joseph knew from their words that his grandfather Isaac was no more. He had died at the time when Joseph was released from prison, and the joy of God in the liberation of Joseph was overcast by his sorrow for Isaac. Then Judah handed his father's letter to Joseph who was so moved at seeing the well-known handwriting that he had to retire to his chamber and weep. When he came back, he summoned Benjamin to approach close to him, and he laid his hand upon his youngest brother's head and blessed him with the words, God be gracious to you, my son. His father had mentioned the children which God has graciously given your servant, and as Benjamin was not among the children thus spoken of, for he was born later, Joseph compensated him now by blessing him with the grace of God. So let's pause right there. What just happened? First of all, we have this line that, that 
Jacob, um, that, that Joseph asks about how Jacob's doing, which is in the Torah. It says, how is your, J Joseph, according to the Torah, says, how is your aged father of whom you spoke? Is he still in good health? Now, the, the Midrash adds that he also asked about his grandfather, which, by the way, he could have asked before when they first came down. He doesn't. But here's, here's an interesting thing. The, the, the Midrash tells us that they only answered about Jacob. They didn't say anything about, about Isaac, which is how Joseph knows that Isaac is now dead. Um, and according to this, Isaac died when Joseph came out of prison, which is interesting because it's, it kind of links those things together. Now, we don't know, we don't know when, when Isaac dies exactly. We do know he lived to be 180 years old. And if you do the math, he is alive well into Joseph's life. So, um, you know, it could be when you, again, you line it up that roughly around that time is when Joseph, uh, when Isaac would have died. Um, but again, it seems to link those two things together that Isaac, Isaac's life ends, comes to an end when Joseph is now safe. When Joseph's out of prison, then Isaac, again, living still in the land of Canaan, is able to die, his protection, to some extent, his protection in this world is now, is now not needed. And so that Isaac can, can die, can expire once Joseph is, is safe. Um, that's a little thing that they threw out here in the Midrash, which is, again, how did Isaac die? When did Isaac die? We don't really know. Uh, we do know that, um, it would, again, it would have been fairly late into, into into Joseph's life. He wouldn't have been a little kid. Um, and again, it's that uh, we have this presentation of the letter, which isn't in the Torah either. And the letter, according to the Midrash, makes Joseph cry. Now, Joseph does indeed cry, but according to, to the Torah, he doesn't cry until he sees Benjamin for the first time. Um, and he does say, according to the Torah, when he does see Joseph, uh, Joseph sees his brother Benjamin for the first time, he says, he saw brother, his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and asked, is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? And he went on, may God be gracious to you, my boy, which is a blessing. And according to the Torah, he did indeed bless Benjamin. And then he said, with that, Joseph hurried out, for he was overcome with feeling toward his brother and was on the verge of tears, he went into a room and wept there. That's what the Torah says as far as when Joseph weeps. According to the Midrash, he actually gets overcome by seeing Jacob's letter. So Jacob's letter is what makes him uh, emotional in the first place. Um, that is, um, that, that, that's an early time that he gets upset. And, and starts weeping. Um, uh, so this is a, this is a, um, an interesting, um, another emotional experience for, for, uh, for Joseph. All right, so he now sees uh, Benjamin, and now let's get to this interesting meal, which the Torah tells us that they have this meal. Um, the, the Torah goes on to say, J, uh, Joseph washed his face. He reappeared, now in control of himself. This is the Torah that tells, tells us this. Gave the order, serve the meal. And it says, they served him by himself and them by themselves. And the Egyptians who ate with them, with him by themselves. For the Egyptians could not dine with the Hebrews, since that would be abhorrent to the Egyptians. The table was set in three oh, divisions. Wait, I was just oh, going to say, that's what the Torah says, that yeah. they sat on different tables. Mm -hmm. they, the Torah says that. Now the Midrash is going to go even further. Now the Torah says that the Egyptians would not eat with the Israelites. So when we learn later on that Jews would not eat at tables with Gentiles, seems kind of, um, uh, well, it seems a little uh, unfriendly maybe off-putting, that people wouldn't dine at the same table together. The Midrash is going to explain why this was the case and why, again, people in the ancient world would not dine with people 
of different uh, backgrounds sometimes. Um, so let's, let's read about this meal. The table was set in three divisions for Joseph, for his brethren, and for the Egyptians. The sons of Jacob did not venture to eat of the dishes set before them. They were afraid they might not have been prepared according to the ritual prescriptions. A punishment upon Joseph for having slandered his brothers whom he once charged with not being punctilious in the observance of the dietary laws. The Egyptians, again, could not sit at the same table with the sons of Jacob because the latter ate the flesh of the animals to which the former paid divine worship. Assumingly, that is the, the rams and the sheep that um, Jacob and his family ate, and the Jews would eat, whereas the Egyptians would not eat those because they worship the sheep. They worship um, Amun-Ra as a, as a deity, and they would not eat animals like that. Um, again, that's what the Torah says. I mean, that's what the Midrash says. The Torah simply says that they ate at different places because it would be abhorrent for the Egyptians to eat with um, with them. And again, the word toeva in Hebrew seems to imply that there's something not, not kosher about this for the Egyptians. But um, the way the Midrash lays it out is that Jake, uh, that Joseph sits at a separate table too. That Joseph is at one table, the Egyptians are at another table, and that the Jacob's fan that Jacob's sons, Joseph's family, are at another table. All right. When all was ready and the guests were to be seated, Joseph raised his cup and pretending to inhale his knowledge from it, he said, Judah is king, therefore let him sit at the head of the table and let Reuben, the firstborn, take the second seat. And thus he assigned places to all his brothers corresponding to their dignity and their age. Moreover, he seated the brothers together who were the sons of the same mother. And when he reached Benjamin, he said, I know that the youngest among you has no brother born by his own mother next to whom he might be seated. And also I have none. Therefore, he may take his place next to me. Wow. So <laughs> that's an interesting scene that the Midrash has happened, which is that he seats everybody according to their age, according to who's their mother. Uh, again, amongst the sons, there's, there's four mothers, right? And so he has them split, a, split apart. And because Benjamin doesn't have any other full brother, he says, you're going to sit by me. Now, what's so weird about that, of course, is that Joseph is, is for, for, from their standpoint, is an Egyptian. He's not Hebrew. Shouldn't be eating with them. But the Torah does tell us portion, this is the last line of chapter 43 of Genesis. And again, this is why this story is in such a great detail in the Torah. It's not just the Midrash that goes off on, onto these kind of like very detailed uh, explanations of things. The Torah almost demands it because the Torah says this. Portions were served from the, his table, but Benjamin's portion was several times that of anyone else. And they drank their fill with him. That's what the Torah says. So the Torah goes into that detail. And then, of course, the Midrash is going to go even further, further. So what happens with this meal? The brothers marveled one with another at all this. During the meal, Joseph took his portion and gave it to Benjamin. And his wife, Asenat, followed his example, and also Ephraim and Manasseh, so that Benjamin had four portions in addition to that which he received like the other sons of Jacob. So all of Joseph's family share their food with, with Benjamin. Wine was served at the meal and it was the first time in 22 years that Joseph and his brothers tasted of it for they had led the life of Nazarites, his brothers because they regretted the evil they had done to Joseph and Joseph because he grieved over the fate of his father. So we got to pause right there. That is the only time that we ever, the Torah does not say that, right? The only time, again, we come across this idea that Joseph's brothers actually did something to kind of make up for what they had done. This is, this is what they did. They gave up alcohol. They became Nazarites. And we read again about the laws of Nazarites, uh, our, our, the name mitzvah, our adult benot mitzvah, 
uh, actually read this section in Naso. They read this Torah portion in Numbers um, back in June. They read about the laws of the Nazarites. The Nazarites are not even allowed to come into contact with grape juice or grapes. They can't touch grapes. They can't touch the fruit. It's a very strict law that they're not allowed to have any intoxicants. They're not allowed to have any alcohol. And this is a real big kind of revelation that, that the brothers have actually been doing something to try to make up for this horrible sin that they, that they committed, that they've actually been doing this. Now, of course, the Midrash also says that Joseph has been doing this too. Well, now Joseph, he's been living in prison for a good chunk of that time. And, uh, you know, one can make the argument he didn't really have much opportunity to drink during that time, maybe as a prisoner. Um, but he would have during the time that he was, uh, he was free, you know, that he was, uh, um, you know, living in the court of the Pharaoh, but that he's not drinking any wine either. And what specifically it says that he's doing it for is for his father, which again, if he's grieving for his father, why didn't he take a moment in these last years to go back and try to find his father? Why, you know, why is it that his father is, you know, still thinking that he's dead he didn't do anything about it. I mean, well, he did. He was not drinking wine. But why didn't he actually let his father know that he's still alive? According to this, he does feel guilty about it. Um, and that, again, maybe that's the way he dealt with his guilt was by being a Nazarite. So none of them have been drinking any alcohol until this point. They haven't drunk wine until this moment. This is their first drink together. It's an interesting midrash. It's an interesting what, what happens at this meal isn't just reunification, it's actually kind of a, a culmination, a conclusion of this act of, of um, repentance that's been going on for years, decades. Okay, here's what happens. Joseph entered into conversation with his brother, Benjamin. He asked him whether he had a brother born by his own mother. And Benjamin answered, I had one, but I do not know what has become of him. Joseph continued his questions. Have you a wife? Benjamin said, yes, I have a wife and 10 sons. Joseph, and what are their names? Benjamin, Bela and Beher and Ashvel, Gera and Naman, Ehi and Rosh, Mupim and Hupim and Ard. Joseph, why did you give them such peculiar names? Yeah, so again, according to the Torah, ben, um, Benjamin has 10 sons. Um, so we do know this in the list of genealogies, in the lists that we have in numbers, uh, we have these, we have this list. So we know he has sons. Um, now that now the Midrash is going to give us an explanation for why they have these names. Uh, and by the way, notice that he says, I don't know what happened to him. Now he could have said, well, what I was told is that he was killed by wild beasts. Like that's what, what, what I was told. The brothers told me that he was killed by wild. He doesn't say that. He says, we don't know what happened to him. It's almost like everybody has been dealing with this, not the way you think they've been dealing with it, which is saying he's dead. But we don't know. We really don't know. We came back with the coat and nobody, you know, my father said that, you know, he jumped to that conclusion, which is a logical conclusion, giving him a bloody ripped up coat, but that we really don't know. And so that's why in the Midrash, we have this kind of collective belief that maybe he's okay. Maybe he's not dead. You can make that claim. They never find a body. So this is this horror that people deal with when they never have the body of the person that they're grieving for. Is that person still alive somehow? Does that person maybe not die? Holding out this hope that maybe he didn't die. Now, now what we're going to find out is that Benjamin has been preserving Joseph's legacy here. This is what we read. Benjamin, in memory of my brother and his sufferings, Bela, because my brother disappeared among the peoples, Beher, because he was the firstborn son of my mother, Ashvel, he was taken away from my father, Gera, he dwells a stranger in a strange land. Naaman, he was exceedingly lovely. Ehi, he was my only brother by my father and my mother together. 
Roche, he was at the head of his brothers. Mupin, he was beautiful in every respect. Hupin, he was slandered and art because he was as beautiful as a rose. So again, all of these names are, you know, have a Hebrew root that may, in some cases, sound like these words, or in some cases, are based on those words. Like the word gera is the, from the word ger, which means a stranger. Uh, becher, bachor means to be chosen, to be uh, first. Uh, again, some of these words in Hebrew are, are very close to what the explanations are given. Some of them, maybe not, maybe not as much, but are poetically connected to, to this. What you can see is that Benjamin actually says that my kids are all named after Joseph in a way. So this must have been really, must have been really powerful for Joseph to hear not only was he not forgotten, but they, they never, that his brother's never given up hope that he'll see him one day, that he's not, you know, that Joseph, they didn't give him up for dead, or at least Benjamin didn't. And so it must have been very moving for him to hear, wow, they, not, again, they don't know who they're talking to, that Benjamin's just told him that, that he's been preserved in the, in the names of his nephews. His nephews are named after him in his story. All right. Joseph ordered his magic astrolabe to be brought to him, whereby he knew all things that happened. And he said to Benjamin, I have heard that the Hebrews are acquainted with all wisdom, but do you know anything of this? Benjamin answered, your servant also is skilled in all wisdom, which my father has taught me. He then looked upon the astrolabe and to his great astonishment, he discovered by the aid of it that he who was sitting upon the throne before him was his brother Joseph. Noticing Benjamin's amazement, Joseph asked him, what have you seen and why are you astonished? Benjamin said, I can see by this that Joseph, my brother, sits here before me on the throne. And Joseph said, I am Joseph, your brother. Reveal not the thing to our brothers. I will send you with them when they go away and I will command them to be brought back again to the city and I will take you away from them. If they risk their lives and fight for you, then I shall know that they have repented of what they did to me, and I will make myself known to them. But if they forsake you, I will keep you, that you should remain with me. They shall go away, and I will not make myself known to them. So here's a, a really interesting story that Midrash has, which is that... Joseph's a wizard. <laughs> Uh, well, that that's not that's not so surprising. Uh, I guess a little surprising. We know he has powers, but, uh, right, but he doesn't. He doesn't get this revelation from God. He gets it through the magic. Well, yeah, but, but Benjamin has the. And Benjamin that does too. I mean, it's not so surprising that somebody who was brought up in Egypt would know magic, but uh, but Benjamin knows it too, <laughs> and yeah. learned it from his father. <laughs> now, here's the amazing thing. The story here basically has given us what we kind of always suspected. The rabbis just kind of laid it out here, which is that Joseph, this is a ruse that Joseph is going to, he's playing a game on his brothers to see whether they'll defend Benjamin. And this will be the final test. This will be the test to see whether or not they are uh, the same or whether they've changed. Or again, more importantly, maybe, maybe he was part of the problem. And maybe Joseph's behavior was also part of what precipitated, you know, his treatment of them. If Benjamin, who is from the same mother, right, the mother that was the favored wife, Rachel, uh, that the, the brothers might have, you know, not liked the way that their mother, Leah, was treated, all that family dysfunction, everything that you could imagine would be part of this story. That's all here, except the Midrash just gave us something that maybe you I didn't even want to have, which is that Benjamin gets in on the, he gets in on the plan that Benjamin is actually told by Joseph, I'm going to, I'm going to play this game out and, and just don't tell you got to go along with it. Now, I mean, I guess it kind of makes Joseph less um, devious or less, uh, you know, you know, maniacal and, and, despotic if he if he includes Benjamin in on the ruse, right? And so Benjamin 
doesn't have to be as fearful as the Torah kind of sets it up, which is Benjamin just, you know, he's, he doesn't know what's happening. Um, you know, he's going to get pulled back and, and then, you know, he must have had a horrible feeling like, you know, what's going to happen to me now? Um, so so the, the Midrash kind of makes Joseph uh, not quite as manipulative, if you will. Um, but it also takes away the tension of the story. It really takes away the fact that um, the, the drama of the way the Torah gets it is really, real, is really yeah. deep. Very funny. So let's take a look at, uh, we'll go back to the Midrash. Um, because again, at this point, it basically says uh, the next line in the Torah, in chapter 44 is, uh, then he, Joseph, instructed his house steward as follows. Fill the men's bags with food as much as they can carry and put each one's money in the mouth of the bag. Put my silver goblet in the mouth of the bag of the youngest one together with his money for the rations as, and he did as Joseph told him. When the light of the first, with the light of the first morning, the, the men sent off with their pack animals and they had just left the city and had not gone far when Joseph said to his steward, up, go after the men. When you overtake them, say to them, why did you repay good with evil? It, it is the very one from which the master drinks and which he uses for divination. It was a wicked thing for you to do. So again, that's the way the Torah gives it, which is the next day they, they leave, they have their food, they go back with their money even again. And now the cup has been put there. So again, the meal itself is very important because it sets up the cup, which again is one of these things that is, uh, according to the Torah, part of the magic that Joseph has is this cup, which we read about when he holds the cup. This cup um, has magic powers. So this is the way the Torah tells it. The Midrash is going to have a few other paragraphs here <laughs> before we get to their return home. So, um, so let's read. Then Joseph inquired of Benjamin what his brothers had told their father after they had sold him into slavery. And he heard the story of the coat dipped in the blood of a kid of the goats. Yes, brother, spoke Joseph. When they had stripped me of my coat, they handed me over to the Ishmaelites who tied an apron around my waist scourged me and bade me run off. But a lion attacked the one that beat me and killed him and his companions were alarmed and they sold me to other people. Not, not, wait a second, no, that's not in the Torah, right? Yeah. So that right. whole scene is not in the Torah, but which allows them, which allows the brothers to kind of um, tell this story and have a story set up, which is still a lie, but it's, I guess, a little less of a lie. There was a wild animal that killed somebody and uh, it, it kind of sets up Joseph's, uh, you know, Joseph's story. So according to this, Benjamin says, I did hear this story. This is the story that I, you know, this is the story that I heard. And here's again, the final paragraph. Dismissed by Joseph with kind words, his brothers started on their homeward journey as soon as the morning was light for it is a good rule to leave a city after sunrise and enter a city before sundown. Besides, Joseph had a specific reason for not letting his brothers depart from the city during the night. He feared an encounter between them and his servants and that his men might get the worst of it. For the sons of Jacob were like wild beasts which have the upper hand at night. That's a weird... <laughs> That's a weird line, uh, but it basically tells us again a little. The midrash gives us some some uh, traveling advice, which is you should leave you should leave uh, you should leave in the morning, early in the morning, and come into your town at the uh, when you're traveling at sunset. Right? Um, it's basically uh, as I'm saying this in my hotel room. You you have an early check you have an early check out and a late check in. You don't, you don't, that's the way you traveled. And obviously you traveled like that thousands of years ago too. You didn't have the ability to, um, uh, again, to uh, 
probably come into m most places, you know, probably had similar situations. There was a caravan, you know, caravan stop uh, 3,000 years ago, or again, your local Holiday Inn. The reality is, is that um, that's how people travel. You know, they come in towards the end of the day and you know, start off in the morning. Uh, but again, the important part of this is that um, uh, Joseph was actually really concerned with how to bring them back because uh, what if they fight and they can fight? The, the, they've already proven that. Simon and, and Levy destroyed a, a town, just the two of them by themselves. So we got to be careful um, how, we, how we go after them. So this is the uh, part of what we're left, uh, how they end that part of the story. Now, this is the part we're going to finish with today. This is them um, actually being confronted uh, with the, the, the theft, which of course is not a theft. It's a setup. It's a setup. It's part of the setup. All right. The thief caught. They were not yet far beyond the city gates when Joseph dispatched Manasseh, the steward of his house, to follow after them and look for the silver cup that he had concealed in Benjamin's sack. He knew his brothers well. He did not venture to let them get too far from the city before he should attempt to force their return. He hoped that the nearness of the city would intimidate them and make them heed his commands. Manasseh, therefore, received the order to bring them to a halt by mild speech if he could, or by rough speech if he must, and carry them back to the city. He acted according to his instructions. When the brothers heard the accusation of theft, they said, with whoever of your servants the cup is found, let him die, and we also will be my Lord's bondmen. And Manasseh said, as you say, it would be proper to do, for if 10 persons are charged with theft and the stolen object is found with one of them, all are held responsible. But I will not be so hard. He whom, with whom the cup is found shall be the bondman, and the rest shall be blamed. He searched all the sacks. Well, and in order so, not so, to so, it so it says right here that it was Manasseh. Once again, it was Joseph's son, Manasseh, who is the steward. So this is, again, somebody who's in on this ruse, somebody who Joseph trusts completely. It's his own son, another Israelite, right? So Manasseh is going to be one of those tribes. Ephraim and Manasseh are, are tribal, tribal heads uh, eventually by the time of Moses, right? So uh, Manasseh is the one who does this. Uh, again, um, you know, Joseph knows that maybe, again, another fellow Israelite, one of his people, can uh, not only be more persuasive, but actually be able to, as we read in the other story of Shimon, how else do you fight? You can't fight one of Jacob's kids with an Egyptian. You got to fight him with another guy with special powers with one of Jacob's uh, descendants, Manasseh. So, uh, so Manasseh is the one who goes after them. So uh, again, this is in the Torah, this scene of going through the bags. He searched all the sacks and in order not to excite the suspicion that he knew where the cup was, he began at Reuben, the eldest, and left off at Benjamin, the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. In a rage, his brothers shouted at Benjamin, oh, you thief and son of a thief, your mother brought shame upon our father by her thievery, and now you bring shame upon us. But he replied, is this matter as evil as the matter of the kid of the goats, as the deed of the brothers that sold their own brother into slavery? Wow. Wow. Now that is a scene that is not in the Torah. The Torah literally says that that scene that uh, um, they searched the steward, again, doesn't say Manasseh, but the steward searched beginning with the eldest and, old, and ending with the youngest, and the goblet turned up in Benjamin's bag. So that scene is there in the Torah, which is a dramatic scene. You know, let's start at the, start at the, at the, at the one end and get to the other. We're not going to go right to the to the person who we know whose bag it's in, the youngest, we're gonna go down the line. We get to the final bag and there it is. That's what it says. Now the Torah only says they rent their clothes, each reloaded the pack animal and they return to the city. That's what it says, they rent their clothes. So they were upset. The Midrash gives us this very interesting 
very interesting conversation, which we got we to gotta comment on this. The brothers turn on Benjamin. They actually said to Benjamin, your mother was a, th- was a thief. Rachel stole, remember, the idols of Laban. Your mother's a thief. You're a thief. Right? They attacked him. They actually showed that they hadn't, they hadn't changed in a way. Right? So the brothers actually show the worst side of themselves, which is that they still have these grievances against Rachel. Uh, they still aren't, they still are not changed, I guess, if you will. And so it does, the Midrash gives us a very, very different picture of what happens here, which is they go to a dark place first. And again, it's a natural, it's a natural, um, it's a natural place to go. It's not, it's, it's actually a, kind of a powerful story, which is that the brothers immediately turn on, on Benjamin and are, uh, you know, accusatory and, you know, like they go bad. They go, they go to the wrong place. Now, of course, Benjamin has a great answer to them. Really? You are the ones who sold a brother, my brother, into slavery. So he counters right away back to them, which is, you're, you're the worst. You think my mother stealing idols was bad? You sold a brother to slavery. Um, so that's the story in the Midrash that, again, gives us even like more drama to this. Because it does say this, as I said, this is in the Torah. In their fury and vexation, the brothers rent their clothes. God paid them in their own coin. They had caused Jacob to tear his clothes in his grief over Joseph. And now they were made to do the same on account of their own troubles. And as they rent their clothes for the sake of their brother Benjamin, so Mordecai, the descendant of Benjamin, was destined to rent his on account of his brothers, the people of Israel. But because mortification was inflicted upon the brothers through Manasseh, the steward of Joseph, the allotment of territory given to the tribe of Manasseh was torn in two. One half of the tribe had to live on one side of the Jordan, the other half on the other side. And Joseph, who had not shrunk from vexing his brethren so bitterly that they rent their clothes in their abasement, was punished in that his descendant, Joshua, was driven to such despair after the defeat of I that he too rent his clothes. Okay, so here's a very interesting midrash that ties in when other people rend their clothes, tear their clothes in the Bible. So tearing your clothes is what you do when you lose, when you when you suffer a loss of a a, li- a loss of life. It's the worst loss that you could have. Is you tear your clothes, right? This is this is what we do. We call it kriya. This is what we do when we tear a ribbon put it on our clothes to this day. So rending our clothes is the outward sign of, uh, of, our, of our worst grief, tearing our clothes and, and, sh- and showing this. So Mordecai does it, tears his clothes, puts on sackcloth and ashes and mourns and prays and fasts during the story of the time of Esther, right? It also tells us that uh, Joshua tore clothes after his one his defeat his singular really bad battle during the time of 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 reconquest or or making israel the holy land during the coming in after moses dies um what's interesting about this midrash is it basically tells us that what joseph did was not a good thing the midrash here has a very severe judgment on what we read about in the Bible. So when we read this story, you know, sometimes we see it as Joseph testing his brothers and trying to see whether they had changed, whether they had repented. The Midrash does something very interesting here, which is it tips its hand on what the rabbis felt about this story in the, in the Bible. They don't like it. They don't like what Joseph does. They don't find it to be the way people should treat each other, testing each other, manipulating each other. They don't like it. They obviously they don't like what the brothers did in the first place. Don't get me wrong. This isn't a, this isn't a uh, you know who's who's worse. They're all bad. 
that's the rabbinic, at least, again, this Midrash gives us this understanding that Joseph shouldn't have done what he did. Causing his brothers this hor horrible fear of uh, losing Benjamin or, again, being, you know, being criminals is not something that you do. You don't play around with people's emotions like this. You don't, you don't put people into these kind of situations. So it's an interesting question. Again, you know, people would say, well, you look at Joseph. He's just, he's just testing his brothers. He wants to see whether they've changed. Rabbis don't like it. They, they, don't, they don't like it. And so if you've ever thought, hey, this doesn't seem to, to be the way people should behave, you're not alone. The rabbis, don't, the rabbis don't hold this up as an example of Joseph being smart, Joseph being kind, Joseph being uh, uh, an example of what you should do when you want to see if people have changed. They don't like it. They don't, they don't like doing this kind of thing to, to people which is kind of good to know. I mean, it's kind of nice to know that these kinds of games are not um, playing with people's emotions and playing with people's feelings are not, are not put in high esteem. So if, um, you know, if you've ever been a victim of this, of course, it doesn't feel nice to be uh, manipulated or tested. Um, and it, the rabbis are definitely cautioning us not to do this ourselves. What happens again is that Joseph get Joseph's descendants. Jo Joseph's descendant Joshua was the one who got punished with this, and even more so, Manasseh, his his Joseph's son, the one who participates in this ruse, again not in the Torah but in the Midrash, Manasseh ends up being punished because his king his territory his tribal portion ends up being split into two, one in one side of the Jordan and one side on the other. So um, this is, um, this, there's a accounting for, for what Joseph does here in this scene. So it's not, it, this is not the judgment on this, this scene in the Bible, which is a huge, as we said, is a long scene. It goes on for several chapters. It shouldn't have happened. Joseph should not have done this. Um, so again, keep in mind, uh, keep this in mind as we read this. That is really kind of the the rabbinic decision on what Joseph does here with this uh, with these chapters. Okay. Convicted of theft beyond the peradventure of a doubt, the brothers of Joseph had no choice but to comply with the steward's command and return to the city. They accompanied him without delay. Each of them loaded his ass himself, raising the burden with one hand from the ground to the back of the beast. And then they retraced their steps cityward. And as they walked, they wrapped Benjamin roughly on the shoulders saying, oh, you thief and son of a thief, you have brought the same shame upon us that your mother brought upon our father. Benjamin bore the blows and the abusive words in patient silence. And he was rewarded for his humility for submitting to the blows upon his shoulder, God appointed that his Shekinah should dwell between his shoulders. And he also called him the beloved of the Lord. Wow. So Benjamin, interestingly, again, because if we understand that he knows what's happening here, that he's, um, you know, in on, the, in, on the, in on the game, the con, if you will, that he doesn't say anything. He goes along with it. And that because his brothers were beating him, basically hitting him on the way back, that he had to go along with it, didn't say anything. So um, interestingly, even though he's going along with it, he, uh, the rabbis account this to his merit, that he, didn't, that he suffered the uh, abuse without saying anything back. You could say, maybe, well, he's, he's in on the game. Shouldn't he also be responsible partly? They don't seem to, to feel that way because again, it's not his game. Uh, and, and they do kind of afford him a pass on that because again, he's the youngest brother who's kind of just kind of a pawn in this game. Uh, but what is, what is Benjamin rewarded with? It says the Shekhinah will be, uh, you know, beyond his shoulder, uh, between his shoulders. This is a reference to the fact that Jerusalem 
the city of Yerushalayim, where the Holy Temple was, where the divine Shekhinah, the divine presence, the feminine presence, by the way, of God, is, is uh, manifest in the world, in Jerusalem, that's in the tribe of Benjamin. So Benjamin is rewarded for being the home of God, if you will, the, or at least the divine presence. So keep that in mind, that that's Benjamin's reward. That's how Benjamin gets rewarded for his, um, for his uh, silence, his patience, his, his uh, going along with this scene. So here's what Joseph's, happens. Joseph's brethren returned to the city without fear. Though it was a great metropolis, in their eyes, it appeared but as a hamlet of 10 persons, which they could wipe out with a turn of the hand. They were led into the presence of Joseph, who, contrary to his usual habit, was not holding a session of the court in the forum on that day. He remained at home, that his brothers might not be exposed to shame in public. They fell to the earth before him, and thus came true his dream of the 11 stars that made obeisance to him. But even while paying homage to Joseph, Judah was boiling inwardly with suppressed rage, and he said to his brothers, Verily, this man has forced me to come back here only that I should destroy the city on this day. Uh -huh. So, so were, the brothers, were the brothers really were were the brothers really worried? No, because they would, have, they would have just destroyed everybody in Egypt. Well, that's one midrash. This is definitely not, again, can't be the only answer, which is that this isn't a good seat. This isn't a good place for them to be at. So here we go. Guarded by his valiant men on the right and on the left, Joseph addressed his brothers snarling, what deed is this that you have done to steal away my cup? I know well you took it in order to discover with its help the whereabouts of your brother that has disappeared. Judah was spokesman and he replied, what shall we say to my Lord concerning the first money that he found in the mouth of our sacks? What shall we speak concerning the second money that also was in our sacks? And how shall we clear ourselves concerning the cup? We cannot acknowledge ourselves guilty for we know ourselves to be innocent in all these matters. Yet we cannot avow ourselves innocent because God has found out the iniquity of your servants like a creditor that goes about and tries to collect a debt owing to him. Two brothers take care not to enter a house of mirth and festivity together that they not be exposed to the evil eye, but we were all caught together in one place by reason of the sin which we committed in company. So uh, Judah is basically saying uh, yeah, we, we, we understand that uh, we've been caught, um, but you don't act, what we've been caught for is not really what you think we've been caught for. What we've been caught for, as far as the money and the cups, the cup, that's not what we've been caught for. It's not. And, and again, what really is the problem is what we did in the first place. And this is, this is um, what happens. Joseph, but if your punishment is for selling Joseph, why should this brother of yours suffer? The youngest, he that had no part in your crime. So let's pause right there because here's the, here's the conversation, okay? So this is gonna go back be, between Joseph and Judah, uh, which again, Judah is the spokesperson according to the Torah. And this is kind of, again, where we're going to finish off today. Judah is the spokesperson in Vayigash, the last portion of this story. And really, it's the second to last portion in all of Genesis. It's Judah that is the one who argues on behalf of the family and, and to spare them. The problem, again, is that now is the confrontation of they have to be exposed for what they did to Joseph. Now, again, Joseph, they don't know, Benjamin knows, according to the Midrash, but none of the other brothers know that they're, they're actually, of course, talking to Joseph. That's the, that's the dr drama, that's the tension, is that they are now kind of defending themselves, not for the stealing, not for the, not for the theft, not for taking the money. It's now, it's now what they did in the first place, which was selling Joseph. And so Joseph says, okay, fine. If what you're really 
copying to is is selling Joseph, not knowing it, and they're not knowing that they're actually speaking to Joseph. Why does Benjamin get punished? Benjamin, Benjamin wasn't part of it, right? So Benjamin wasn't wasn't the was one of the ones that sold me. Again, now so this is part of the drama that the midrash gives, in a way, is a little bit better version of it because it does get to does beg the question. So Benjamin is being included in this. So here's what happens. Judah, a thief and his companions are taken together. Joseph, if you could prevail upon yourself to report to your father concerning a brother that had not stolen and had brought no manner of shame upon you, that a wild beast had torn him, you will easily persuade yourselves to say it concerning a brother that has stolen and has brought shame upon you. Go hence and tell your father, the rope follows after the water bucket. But, continued Joseph, shaking his purple mantle, God forbid that I should accuse you all of theft. Only the youth that stole the cup in order to divine his brother's whereabouts shall remain with me as my bondman. But as for you, get you up in peace to your father. The Holy Spirit called out, Great peace have they which love your law. The brothers all consented to yield Benjamin to the ruler of Egypt. Only Judah demurred, and he cried out, Now it is all over with peace. And he prepared to use force, if need be, to rescue Benjamin from slavery. So, according to the Midrash, it's only Judah that was willing to fight for Benjamin. The other brothers, according to the Midrash, are willing to, okay, you get to keep Benjamin. You keep Benjamin. Benjamin is the thief. Benjamin appeared to steal this. Uh, keep him. It's Judah who says, no, that's not going to fly. So, so the Midrash actually sets up, um, sets up the story in a, in a slightly more dramatic way in that the brothers, the other brothers were, were fully wet, ready to go. The Torah doesn't say, doesn't say that, but it kind of makes what Judah does even more powerful. It, um, it basically is giving Judah credit for uh, doing something really dramatic, which is not only defending Benjamin, uh, uh, you know, but, but actually doing it on his own, that none of the other brothers were even willing to do this. Um, and, and so it, it gives Judah even more, to some extent, more credit and more praise for doing this. Let's read, let's, we have a little bit more time. Let's read, we'll read a little bit of this uh, right now. Let's try it. Well, it's so good. I, I don't want to, I don't want to leave it for, for next week. Here's Judah what pleads and threatens. Joseph dismissed his brethren and carried Benjamin off by main force and locked him up in a chamber. But Judah broke the door open and stood before Joseph with his brothers. He determined to use, in turn, the three means of liberating Benjamin at his disposal. He was prepared to convince Joseph by argument or move him by entreaties or resort to force in order to accomplish his end. Scroll. He spoke, you do a wrong to us. You who said, I fear God, you show yourself to be like a Pharaoh who has no fear of God. The judgments which you pronounce are not in accordance with our laws, nor are they in accordance with the laws of the nations. According to our law, a thief must pay double the value of what he has stolen. Only if he has no money, he is sold into slavery. But if he has the money, he makes double restitution. And according to the law of the nations, the thief is deprived of all he owns. Do so, but let him go free. If a man buys a slave and then discovers him to be a thief, the transaction is void. Yet you desire to make one a slave whom you charge with being a thief. I suspect you of wanting to keep him in your power for illicit purposes, and in this lustfulness, you resemble Pharaoh. Also, you are like Pharaoh in that you make a promise and do not keep it. You said to your servants, bring your youngest brother down to me that I may set my eyes upon him. Do you call this setting your eyes upon him? If you desired nothing except a slave, then you would surely accept our offer to serve you as bondmen instead of Benjamin. Reuben is older than he, and I exceed him in strength. It cannot be but as I say, 
you have a lustful purpose in mind with our brother. Wow. So there's, there's Judah. I, I wanted to end. I wanted to end before we got to this in a way, because this is just going to leave people with strange nightmares and dreams. But uh, yeah, you, you, this is the Midrash. The Midrash actually has here that um, this is you just trying to get your hands on our brother for sexual purposes. Uh, uh, otherwise, you would have taken one of us. Now you want this, you want this beautiful brother of ours. Uh, and so this is Judah. Um, first he makes the arguments that your, your, your penalty doesn't make sense. It's not, it's not following our laws. It's not following other nations laws when it comes to theft. You are, um, you're not behaving. You're not, you're not following any law. There's no legal precedent for doing what you're doing. Now, on top of this, I'm going to get to what I think you really were trying to do all along, which was try to get your hands on our brother, which is creepy, was creepy from the very, per, very first time you said it, which is you want to set your eyes on him. What kind of language is, you know, what kind of weird thing is that? You wanted him all along for your, you know, for your sexual purposes. That's what he basic. I mean, it's what the Midrash says. So he says, he says, I knew it all along. Judah saying, I knew this was what you were up to. So we're going to read a couple more paragraphs and then we're going to pause it there. Because this is, this is a really, really long section, by the way. This, this section is, that's why I didn't, I was kind of going to not even get into it. But uh, we, had a, we had a few extra minutes. So I wanted to, I, I, I didn't want to leave you yet. Uh, this great, this great uh, Midrash here. We'll read a couple more paragraphs. Therefore, let these words of mine, which I am about to speak, find entrance into your heart. For the sake of the grandmother of this lad, were Pharaoh and his house stricken with sore plagues, because he detained her in his palace a single night against her will. His mother died a premature death by reason of a curse which his father uttered in inconsiderate haste. Take heed then that this man's curse strike you not and slay you. Two of us destroyed the whole of a city on account of one woman. How much more would we do it for the sake of a man? And that man, the beloved of the Lord, in whose allotment it is appointed that God shall dwell. So, so just, just, in, case you, just in case you missed that, uh, yeah, we're, 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 we're real badasses and we will kill you. We've killed people for less. We've killed people for, for, um, sexually assaulting women what more will we do if you sexually assault a man which again is what you just read i'm not i'm not changing the meaning of anything that you just read um yeah that's what they just said if you if you lay a finger on him it's going to be really bad and of course they brought in these uh in case you forgot here's what happens to people who mess with us who try to uh if you try, you know, any of your funny business with the Jewish people, just remember what happened to Pharaoh with Sarah. Just remember what happened to, to Rachel, who, who um, you know, got into trouble because our father inadvertently uttered a curse against her. Think about how much power we have, and you don't want to mess with that. So he's threatening. What does he mean about the curse? He's talking about when, jo when Jacob um, told Laban, anybody who took your idols, let All them right. die. And that's this crazy, like in the, in the, the rabbis won't let that go, which is that yeah. Jacob inadvertently caused Rachel a premature death by laying down that curse. He said to Laban, whoever has these idols will should die. And so he did it. He, he actually cursed his own wife. So yeah, don't, don't mess with us. And uh, again, <laughs> how much more so for the sake of a man? Uh, and again, not only any man, the one who, who's eventually going to be, his descendants are going to be the host for Jerusalem, right? For the, for the, uh, for the ark. All right. One more paragraph. If I, but utter a sound death dealing pestilence will stalk through the land as far as no in this land, Pharaoh is the first and you are the second after him. But in our land, my father is the first and I am the second. If you will not comply with our demand, I will draw my sword and hew you down first and then Pharaoh. All right, we're going to leave it off right there. And next week, we're going to come back to this exciting conclusion of this 
this duel between uh, Judah and Joseph. And again, of course, Judah doesn't know that the person that he's uh, threatening is Joseph, who is more powerful in many ways than he is. Now, Judah, of course, is very powerful, but um, Joseph is pretty powerful in his own right and has some magic powers of his own, but he doesn't know that. And uh, of course, that's part of the drama. The drama was already there. The rabbis took it up another level with this story. And again, they're bringing in other parts of the Torah. They didn't, these are other parts of the Torah. You know, uh, Simon and Levi killing Shechem, they referred to a lot. The propensity or the ability for, for uh, the sons of Jacob to wreak violence, the power that they have simply by uttering a blessing or a curse. And of course, the fact that God also uh, defends defends us uh, sometimes. I don't know, picks and chooses when, but there there are times when God comes to our aid and and uh, and strikes people with pestilence. In the meantime, everybody, uh, stay safe and healthy, and don't get struck with any pestilence, any death dealing <laughs> pestilence, please. And uh, again, it was great seeing you all, at least virtually, here today. And uh, Again, stay healthy. Stay healthy, everybody. And join us uh, again tomorrow night for Torah study. If you have it, if you have the opportunity, we're going through uh, Deuteronomy, and we're we're reading my my uh, portion of my bar mitzvah, which was forty years ago. So you're gonna chant it then tomorrow? I I will if you want. I don't. I'll chant a little piece of it. All right. All right, everybody. Take care. See you tomorrow. Bye bye bye. Bye bye. Bye carefully. Thanks. Thanks everybody.